let's click this button and start sharing my screen. So welcome to Deep Dive with DUI. And today our presenter is, is Dick Long. Uh, Dick Long is the CEO and founder of DUI. He has been diving for over 67 years and he is one of the first NAWI instructors, um, which by the way is back in 1960. So if you think you've been a dive instructor diving for a while, um, not very many people have been diving longer than Dick has. Um, he also started DUI back in 1963. And with that, I'm going to pass this over to Dick Long. First of all, uh, this was a, a, a great project uh, done back uh, before the year 2000 and the recovery of this gold. And it, it appears on YouTube. And uh, uh, Jack here at the end of the program will give you an address so you can go see that entire documentary that was done. It's, it's quite interesting. But during the documentary, they only tell you what they want you to know. And they're not going to tell you about some of the other things that happened. And so uh, I'm going to tell you the things they didn't, they're not going to tell you in that, in that film. Anyway, um, America supplied a lot of fighter aircraft and tanks and guns to Russia during World War II. The Russians paid for that material with gold. And, um, and that gold was transported to, to the United States by Great Britain. One of those shipments was aboard the HMS Edinburgh, um, uh, and, and she was in the North Atlantic uh, carrying the, uh, what was then a, a $100 million worth of the gold. And when a Russian, uh, I'm sorry, a German submarine accidentally sur uh, surfaced right directly behind her, total surprise. And they ended up firing a torpedo into the stern of the ship, uh, which disabled its rudders uh, to the point that the, the, the ship uh, had to, to drive around in circles. They couldn't, they couldn't have, have it drive in a straight line. Uh, the, the Germans um, uh, wanted to get the radar off of that ship because they knew radar worked, but they didn't know how it worked. So what they were going, trying to do was, was to, to, to capture that. They sent out a couple of destroyers, but destroyers' guns did not have the range that the Edinburgh's guns did, and the Edinburgh made short work of at least one of them. And so the, uh, the battle raged on for three days. The, the uh, uh, British knew that the, uh, the, the Germans were sending out bigger ships to capture uh, the Edinburgh, hopefully, so again, so they could get the radar. So what they did was they loaded all of their dead onto, because they had a, a number of ships there with them and they all took uh, uh, damage. They loaded their dead on the Edinburgh and then they put a torpedo into her themselves and they sunk it to the, the bottom in 800 feet of water. Uh, uh, and in the meantime, uh, the, uh, the, the Lloyds of London paid off the United States for the gold, and that that was there. They, they thought the gold was out of the reach of anybody forever. Um, years later, uh, there was a, a, a group of people who developed saturation diving uh, to s service the oil field, and uh, that, that they were a very enterprising and uh, brave bunch of people. I know I was part of that that group. Um, and uh, they learned of the of the gold there that that excited them. So they put together a proposal and they went to the four the the, the different people that were involved. And that's the Russians, uh, that's the Lloyd's of London, and the British government. And they made what's called a no cure, no pay contract. That means that, that you pay all your own expenses, and if you don't recover the gold, you don't get paid anything. So it's a, it's, it's a potential for a, a great loss. Anyway, they, 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 they made that agreement, and they hired a German diver support vessel, DSV, uh, that had a diving bell, and they use uh, dynamic positioning so they don't have to put anchors down and they, they can sit right over the top of a target. Uh, so uh, they then uh, uh, got, got ready to, to do the project. They, uh, they tried to be prepared for everything. In fact, for 
uh, uh, two weeks prior to going, they put the divers aboard the sister ship of the Edinburgh, which is the HMS Belfast. The HMS Belfast, of course, survived the world, the war, and is now a museum in the Thames River in London. So they put these divers aboard the vessel and they blindfolded them so that they could find their way up and down passageways to get from any of the uh, of the entrances of the ship to the gold room. The, the 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 problem was when they did find the ship, they there was so much damage done that all the passageways were imploded into one another, and they were un, unable to do that. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, okay, uh, okay, now the. Uh, Okay, so anyway, so the salvage team was made up of a diving company called 2W. It stood for Wharton and Williams, uh, and, and they had the divers. The, the Stefanotorum was a German ship, and the Russians put two inspectors aboard the ship. Actually, they did two things. One, they had a, uh, a Russian destroyer that they put off off to one side and that just stayed out there for the, the months they were there. And they put two Russians who spoke excellent English aboard the ship as inspectors. They wanted to make sure nothing was going on they didn't know about and they didn't approve of in, in advance. And once once they got on the site, then the any supplies that went to the ship had to go to and from uh, a Russian port so that no one could take any gold off of that ship uh, by some uh, nefarious means. Anyway, um, uh, during the uh, th during the diving operations, uh, uh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to look at my notes here. I'm sorry about that, folks. Anyway, um, the, uh, it, it, the the Edinburgh. Um, they found the Edinburgh, but they, they had a little difficulty identifying it at first because she was so torn up by the damage when they got on board, she was all torn up. She didn't look like a warship anymore. She looked like a pile of junk. Anyway, um, uh, they, they finally did find it. They, they tried to, to go in and go down the passageways to the gold room or what they, could, what they call the bomb room. And, uh, and it was uh, impossible to get there that way. So they ended up having to cut through the outside of the hull uh, to get into to what they called the bomb room, which I call the gold room. Anyway, um, uh, and it took them quite a while to do that. And of course, they didn't know that they would actually be successful in finding it. Um, now, uh, normally when you have saturation diving going on, uh, because of the the gas is very dense and and so when you're talking to the divers you you try to ask them questions that they can answer either yes or no you do not want them talking in long sentences so and and you pay a lot of attention to the breathing because that tells you how hard they're working anyway when they finally did get a diver into the gold room Again, this is a man who never speaks other than saying yes or no. All of a sudden, he starts saying, I found it. I found it. I found it. And so the top side says, what did you find? And he says, I found it. I found it. He won't shut up. So they're trying to talk to him, calm him down. He just says, I found it. Anyway, they, so what they did was they control the gas mixture going to the diver. They control that gas mixture. So what they did was they turned down the oxygen content of the gas so that when they turned it down, finally his speech got slurred and he got slowing down and talking like this. And finally said, George, yeah, did you find the gold? Yeah, I found it. Okay, George, I just sit still here until we get your gas supply back up. And then we want you to pick up two gold bars and take them out to the diving bell. So uh, they, they brought the gas up and he went back out to the diving bell. He, he carried the two gold bars. Now, those, those gold bars weighed, uh, I, I figure, around 26 pounds a piece. Anyway, uh, when he get out to the diving bell, they put the gold bars in a basket that sits underneath the diving bell. It's made of metal and they have, they put four padlocks on it. Now at this point, I think you can all see me. This is a copy 
This is a direct copy of the gold bar that they made, but it's made of lead. Now, gold is twice the weight of lead, twice the weight of lead. So that gold bar weighed about 26 pounds. This one only weighs about 13 pounds. And it has all of the numbers that off of the gold bar that they, they got. And they had, um, and, and there, there you can see a picture that, was, that I took of, of the bar. And anybody wants to come to my house, you can see the thing and you can feel it. It's quite heavy. And fact is, uh, when I went to visit the guys that uh, 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 salvaged this thing, the, the guy, uh, I went to his office, he said, hey, Dick, uh, close the door. Well, he had one of these bricks. And how they plated it with gold, I don't know. But he had this brick holding the door open. So I come over with my foot, push the gold bar aside. And I mean, I'm just fascinated because that thing was worth a quarter of a million dollars in theory. And, and I, I asked him later, I said, is that real? He says, no, no, but it fooled you. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a fact. Anyway, so they bring the gold bar, they put it in the basket, they close the padlocks, they get in and they, and they tell the course topside that, that, they that they found the gold and they start bringing the diving bell up. In the middle, so now they've announced to the people on board the ship that they found the gold. No one on board a ship that's working is supposed to have any alcohol offshore. That is a forbidden thing. Um, uh, but somehow or other, alcohol appeared and everybody was celebrating. Anyway, uh, uh, the, when they get in the middle of that whole thing, they had a shift change. Now, when you're offshore like that, you work 12 hours on, 12 hours off. That's all you can do is eat, sleep, and, and work. So in the meantime, they had a shift change. The, when, the new di when the new crew came on board and they recovered the diving belt, they're sitting there looking at this basket with the gold in it. The Brits were down there right away with their padlocks, uh, their keys, and unlocked the padlock. Where are the Russians? The Russians are nowhere to be found. So the guys are waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, that, now these guys are offshore oil guys. They are not they are used to a lot of danger, but also you can't tell them they can't do something because they keep proving they can do it every day. So a guy gets excited, he gets a cutting torch out, and, he, and so he cuts the padlocks, the two Russian padlocks off of the, 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 the basket. He opens the basket, he takes the two gold bars out, and all of a sudden the Russians show up and they're, they're, they've he's got the two gold bars and he's rubbing against his beard and he's got his feet in the basket and the Russian says what the hell do you think you're doing and the guy and the guy says the kid says hey what the hell do you think I'm doing and the, and the, and the, the, the one guy pulls his radio out now if he if he hits that radio he's going to call in the destroyer and that's going to be the end of the project. And, and so the, about that time, the other Russian, and I think he probably had a little bit to drink, uh, the Russian says, uh, the other Russian starts laughing. Then all of a sudden, everybody else starts laughing. So then the guy with her looks at his radio, puts the radio back in his pocket. He starts laughing. They're slapping each other on the back, all jumping up and down, all excited that they, they found the gold. So uh, that, that project could have stopped right there. Anyway. Uh, the uh, okay, that's that's that part. Um, uh, okay, uh, okay, okay. Now, in, in the early days of saturation diving, we had a number of problems we really didn't have a solution for. One of the things that happens is inside those chambers, you're at 100% humidity and they had a real problem with ear infections. And when you got ear infections under those conditions, uh, uh, you had to bring the divers up. So they, they had several divers there that got ear infections and they had to lock, put them in the decompression side, bring the chamber up. So they put new divers in, that wasn't a problem. They had divers, but they didn't have hot water suits, which of course we made for them. Uh, they didn't have hot water suits that would fit those new divers. So they called me up and they said, look, we're up here and, and we need hot water suits, but we need them right, right away in a hurry. So what we worked literally 24 hours a day and we built suits for them in less than two days. Uh, 
We put them on an airplane. They flew them into Russia. Then, because again, the Russians controlled everything and went to and from that ship when it was on scene. So what they did was they, the Russians had a helicopter fly out because the Stefano term, which is the name of the, the Russian, I'm sorry, the German uh, DSV, uh, had a, a, a landing platform, a helo deck, and they landed uh, there and they delivered the, the suits. And of course, the rest of the job got finished. Anyway, um, uh, by by now they they were collecting the the gold. And, I mean, they were just every dive they were bringing up hundreds of pounds of gold each dive, and so now they had about eight hundred thousand dollars worth of gold recovered, and the seas were really getting rough. And th remember, they're using dynamic positioning, so they don't have anchors. They have propellers on the ship with sensors on the bottom, and and it controls. Uh, those sensors tell the ship where they are and they can control it within 10 feet, uh, the surface ship 10 feet of, over the target. What, what would happen if you ever lost dynamic positioning, the ship, which they, they had that happen a couple of times, and if the diver's inside something, which also happened, the, the ship pulls off, it ruptures the umbilical and the divers are lost. So they didn't want to have that happen. So what they did was they said, look, look, we're going to terminate we're going to terminate the dive now. We'll come back next year and get the rest of the gold because now they had the majority. They had 80% of the gold. So what they did was they terminated it. They brought everybody back up, and now they're, they're, heading, they're heading for Murmansk. And in Murmansk, uh, which is where the, uh, uh, the Russians were going to take their part of the gold. So they're, 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 everybody's excited. Everybody's from... In the meantime, one of the things they did when they were planning what happens if we have to blow holes through armor plate. Well, when you want to blow holes through armor plate, that's a big deal. You, not everybody can do that. And the military, of course, has ways of doing that. The only people they had that knew anything about that was the SAS. The SAS is, is, let's just say, the equivalent of SEAL team in the United States, and they have specialists in all kinds of things. So what they did was they got, and, and one of the deals that the Russians made was there will be no military people aboard that ship. They said, I sir, no military people aboard that ship. So what they did was they had the guy uh, take leave from them from the, the, the military, and, and he adopted a false uh, identity is what he did and then he signed on board as a crewman of the ship he wasn't a diver he was a, just he, he could scuba dive but he, he was not a saturation diver anyway so so he was aboard the ship as a crewman he also was a bit of a hysteria a historian anyway so what he did was oh and um uh where's my okay what oh uh i forgot to to did, did you show the pictures of the gold? Uh, I showed some of it. Okay. Okay. Okay, anyway. So, uh, when the, when, during the battle, the communications room was above the, uh, where they stored the gold. And so, it, it ruptured in the battle, it ruptured down into the place where they had the gold. And this was a, a page off of a code tablet, okay? And that code tablet um, is when, when you get uh, signals coming in, you write down whatever the code is saying here. Then, then after you get done with that, then you go to your code books and then decode what was sent to you. This, is a, uh, this was the last page on the tablet, and it's the only one that has the date, which was 1935 when this, when this was uh, generated when they, when they created this form, and um, uh, and the the company that did this again, I I played a part in both in, in part of the planning of it, and then then when we made those suits, the company came and they gave me this, and they gave me this gold bar. Uh, as a result, and they gave me the pictures, which I am ever so grateful for. I'm really very lucky. In my lifetime, I've got a chance to play a part in a lot of really interesting things. I was involved in the first thousand foot dives, um, and those were really scary because the last guys tried that uh, got hurt really bad. Anyway, um, um, 
anyhow, uh, so so here we've got this guy on the ship. They're all excited. They're all they're all rich guys now, and they're going back up to Murmansk, where they're going to give the Russians their part of the gold. Then they're going to go home and offload their part. So uh, he says. I haven't blown up anything the whole time I've been here. And of course, that's what I do. And so uh, they, he's, so what he does, he gets out a bunch of his explosives. He wires them all up. He throws them off the back of the ship. Then a big boom goes off. A huge column of water goes up in the air. And, and all the, everybody is all excited, clapping and whatnot. All over the north of Russia, all over the north of Russia, these guys that are listening are going, because the, their eardrums have actually been imploded by the sign, sound this explosion made. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Russian destroyer is following them back into port. The Russian destroyer says, whatever happened isn't what's supposed to happen. So he puts on his siren going, whoop, 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 whoop. Radios the Stefanos term says, stand by to be boarded. And the, the Russian skipper, I'm sorry, the German skipper of the Stefano term says, the whole time they've been on this job, the Brits have been razzing him, the Russians have been razzing him, and he's just taken all he's gonna take. He says, no Russians are gonna board my ship. So he orders his crew to, to take on small arms to prepare to pre repel borders. That's that's a really serious, serious situation. And if you want to get the shoot match, you don't use small arms against a destroyer that's got big guns. If that happened and they sunk the ship, the $800 million of gold would have gone to the bottom and then nobody would be rich anymore. As it is, the 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 value of the gold was in everybody's mind and say look stop 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 don't do anything so what happened was the russians backed off the brits said i don't know who set off that explosion but we'll find out who did it and we'll arrest them when they get to, uh, back to scotland and the russians of course the russians wanted the gold so they said okay we'll accept that so they come into port and they went into again they went into murmansk so they get up to the dock, they uh, put out the gangway, the Russians come up the gangway, and again, in the gold room, they had the four padlocks, just like they had on the basket. And they, there are four padlocks, two, two keys are held by the Brits, two keys are held by the Russians. In the meantime, in, in this whole process, the, the divers had decompressed, they got out of the chamber, uh, and also when they got there, the Russians were allowed to go inside the chamber and inspect everything, make sure nobody had hit any gold bars anywhere. They even looked inside the human waste disposal system to make sure they didn't put some gold bars down there. So the, the divers now are all sitting on the top of the ship and they're all excited uh, uh, up there and they're watching the Russians come on board. The divers had taken super glue and put in all of the padlocks. No keys would fit into the padlocks. So what happened now was the Russians are really pissed. They're really pissed. Anyway, but again, on the other side of that wall is hundreds of million dollars worth of gold. The largest percentage of it ended up going back to the Russians because that was in uh, the ocean controlled by Russian territory, and they consider that to be vital to their national defense. So you had to make a deal with them, even though, if you will, they had no right to the gold legally, I guess. Anyhow, so they cut the gold, the locks off. The gold, Russians get their their gold, and <coughs> excuse me, they they then head for Scotland. Uh, when the ship comes into Scotland, when you have a ship come in from sea, especially one that's been out there for a while, protocol says you have to have doctors go aboard the ship to to verify there's no one on board that ship that's got a disease that you're going to bring in and spread amongst the public. Excuse me. So. The doctors come on board and are inspect the ship, inspecting all the people. In the meantime, the, all the guys' girlfriends and wives are there, and a number of them bought brand new Porsches because they could order them from with the radios. So they're sitting, their their girlfriends and wives and. 
Porsches are sitting there on the dock, and you're not going to keep these guys on the ship waiting for this, some doctors to tell them it's okay to go. So, so they go down the gangway. In the meantime, at the bottom of the gangway, they've got police, and the police know who this guy is they're looking for. So they let those guys off, but the perpetrator that set off the explosion didn't get off that ship. In the meantime, they with the crane, they offloaded the gold. They had a a uh, armored, a big armored car, not just a regular one, but a big one because they had tons of gold. Okay, and they put those those uh, uh, boxes of gold inside of the ship. These were huge boxes inside the in, in inside the the armored car. They had a a car full of armed guards to go in front of it, and they had a car full of armed guards to go behind it. In the meantime, the, the truck with all the gold on it takes off with the armed guards, and they're driving across Scotland. In the meantime, the police go aboard the ship, and they can't find this guy anywhere. He is just not to be found. In the meantime, you know, armored cars are made not to break into. Nothing was ever done to prevent anybody from breaking out of one. So here they are. They're going up a steep hill. There aren't any many steep hills in Scotland. They're, we would call them little hills, but they call them big hills. <coughs> anyway, the car is going, the truck is going up a really steep hill, and it's all the way down to first gear going really slow. All of a sudden, a box inside the armored car opens. The SAS guy gets out because he was laying on top of the gold bars, and he is now... Uh, 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 he's now inside. He waits till he gets to the right place. He opens the back door, waves at the guards in the back, <coughs> jumps out on the ground, hops over the fence, runs across the field. The trucks and cars stop. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to leave the gold there and go chase this guy? They can't do that. So, so <laughs> what they do is they go close the door in the back of the thing and drive off. In the meantime, the guy goes over the, the hill, and while, while all the police are sitting there watching, a helicopter lifts off. The SAS is not going to let one of their very valuable experts be captured and put in jail just because he set off an explosion. Anyway, <coughs> later on, later on, they, they, they did uh, have some court action, and I think he paid a fine of some kind, but it wasn't very much. But also, the Russians wanted the rest of the gold, because they, they still had $200 million down there, and the Russians wanted to get the rest of the gold. And getting involved in this thing could mess it up, uh, so that's what they did. They went back and got the gold. The guy got off, and everybody ended up with a lot of money and, hap and if you will, living happily ever after. Okay, uh, boss, I'm ready for questions if you have some. Um, yeah, well, uh, first, uh, I'd like to go back and, because you talked about the, the, the Edinburgh being in pieces, um, and I know that when we had talked about this before, uh, you said that there's a sister ship, um, so I want to bring up that sister ship. Yeah, the Edinburgh. I, I'm sorry, the Belfast. And that's where the divers went on board and wore blindfolds to find their way around it. Right. So they practiced going through the sister ship to, to see where they could navigate to that. That's right. They had to learn by feel because they felt they might not be able to see anything. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, that ship is now a museum in the Thames River. It's a World War II museum. And if you ever go to London, you can go aboard it. That's not a small ship. It's a cruiser. Um, also, going back a little bit, um, can you briefly talk about um, uh, saturation diving and how that came about and how that's different than, I guess, the normal diving that we would... Uh, sure. Okay. Look, in saturation diving, one of the things they learned... Um, Gee was let's see, it had to be back in the early 60s, that once you put someone under pressure, excuse me, we, we all deal with decompression tables. Decompression tables are a, a, a mathematical computation of how fast we take on gas at different depths and in, in such a way that we come up slowly enough to allow that same gas that we took in to get back out. 
okay, the inert gas, the nitrogen or helium, would, would, whatever the inert gas is. And in reality, which most people may not be aware of, yes, we need oxygen to live, but, but uh, when the oxygen gets out of the cells, it gets converted to carbon dioxide and comes back into our lungs. Most of the gas we're breathing, which is nitrogen, is designed to get rid of that carbon dioxide. So uh, therefore, the, the, the hemoglobin of the blood loves uh, carbon dioxide much better than it loves oxygen. So, uh, but when we descend in the water column, and, and, uh, uh, we can get to a point where the oxygen level can become so high, it's around, it's, it's uh, two atmospheres of pressure around 300 feet, uh, then uh, that oxygen becomes toxic to us. But, but in saturation diving, we're not dealing with that. All, all it means is the deeper we go, the less percentage of oxygen in the gas we're breathing is. Okay, so I'll put that aside. We're gonna be breathing an inert gas of some kind again to flush the carbon dioxide out of our system. Okay, so you can only use nitrogen down so level before the nitrogen becomes so heavy that it gives you nitrogen narcosis and all kinds of bad problems. So what they did then was in, uh, substitute helium for for uh, uh, nitrogen, <clears throat> and it, and the same rules apply with nitrogen it, it, or with helium as it does with nitrogen. Once you're under pressure for 12 hours, your body is going to absorb all of the inert gas you're breathing that is going to. So therefore, it if you're underwater for 12 hours, it's going to take you the same amount of time to decompress as it does for 12 days. So therefore, once you become under there for 12 hours, we say your body has become saturated. So that's for, that's for, that's what we call saturation diving. Now, when you're breathing helium, because that's what we breathe at deep water, okay, it, we, when we calculate the decompression, and this is a rough order of magnitude, but it takes about one day of decompression for every 100 feet of depth you are at. One day of decompression for every 100 feet of depth you're at. So in these guys' cases, they were at 800 feet. Therefore, it took eight days for them to decompress. Did I answer your question? Yes. Um, so I know that uh, when you were doing your, your NAWI instruction, you had a, an instructor um, who was involved in saturation diving. That's right, Albert Benke. Albert Benke was a, a Navy diving doctor. And uh, uh, he, I, I, I was really a very, very lucky guy. I had a number of the pioneers of diving uh, there in that first NAWI class. Albert Benke was one of them. Uh, uh, he signed, uh, uh, I'm NAWI instructor number 49, uh, and they gave out numbers by uh, 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 alphabetical order. And uh, so that means we had close to, to 100 guys there uh, taking the tests. And um, anyway, uh, he signed mine. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the other guy that, um, he was on the Bathyscaphe Trieste when, when they made the deepest dive ever made. Um, mm. So, so, so um, Albert um, Benke, he, he's the one that came up with saturation diving or? He came up with the concept of saturation diving, yes. Okay, so. And then, and then Captain Vaughn picked it up from him because he had retired by that time. And Captain Vaughn picked it up from him and actually, uh, 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 Walt Mazzoni was the executive officer on Sea Lab, and he was the guy who actually made it work. Walt Mazzoni was. Um, we lost him a couple of years ago. Okay. So another question is, um, because they're doing the saturation diving, how long were the divers uh, going down for their bottom time and going inside of each inside the ship? Um, for their recovery eff efforts? I mean, what was their like cycle? Um... Okay, and when you're, they had uh, uh, at least six guys in saturation. And usually when you have teams like that, you have two men in a team and that's what they did. They had two men in a team. And when you would go down, you would do a six hour bell run. And uh, one diver would be out for three hours, then he'd come back, 
get inside the diving bell, take his helmet off. Then the other guy would put the helmet on and go back out for three hours. When they got done with that, they'd bring him back in, then bring the bell up, change out the crew, go down and do another six hour bell run. Um, uh, and, and that's, excuse me, you, you, you have some putting the bell down and picking the bell up in, in that. Uh, that's really hard work. And, and in their case, in their case, more so than anywhere else, what they were doing was picking up gold bars and carrying those gold bars out to the diving bell and putting the bars in the basket. So that's what they're doing. They were walking back and forth, carrying these bars of gold and putting them in the basket. So how uh, from the beginning of the project did it take before they actually found the gold bars in the ship? Because they were, you know, the ship was, you know, collapsed or, or, you know, destructed and poor. It, 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 it was terribly torn up by, well, like I said, they had a hard time even identifying what ship it was. It was so torn up. Well, and you even saw the back end of it in the pictures, the whole, all the plates and everything were, were lifted up. It was, it was really destroyed. Uh, uh, how long it took, I don't know. That that uh, documentary that I just referred to probably tells you. I also, since we set this up, I got another book. Uh, this is called The Gold Finder, and it's written by one of the divers on board the ship. And it has a couple of chapters in there because he was a salvage diver and, and worked on a number of salvage projects, of which that was probably the height of his life. Um, and... Uh, it, it talks about it, but I, I just got it yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to look up uh, that, that kind of data. So there's also an, another book um, that some of this information can be found on. Uh, it's called The Last Call for HMS Edinburgh, The Story of, of Russian Convoys. Um, and in this book, there's, uh, it, it talks about this whole, uh, uh, the, pro or <laughs> the history behind the ship it's sinking and also the recovery of that gold. Yeah, it, it, it really details the battle. Uh, it, it, doesn't it doesn't say anything about the recovery of the gold, but it talks all about the battle uh, when the ship was lost. Uh, it, um, look, war is a horrible thing. And good people, and to be honest with you, good people on both sides get killed because politicians have to decide to show who's bigger, better than anybody else. Uh, I, I, I happen to have some bad feelings about that because yeah, I, I was almost in one. Yeah. So uh, another question is about, um, are there any special skills or training that's required to start doing saturation diving for anyone that might be interested in this? Uh, actually, and, and you will have two weeks from now, uh, uh, one of our, the, the, our guy that's in charge of commercial diving things, and he has spent uh, something like 18 years as a commercial diver, uh, 13 of them as a, as a saturation diver. I think the deepest depth he ever went to was like 745 feet, something like that. And um, uh, the, the way that works, if you want to become a saturation diver, then you go to dive school. And dive school will take you a number of months to go through. When you graduate from dive school, you graduate as a qualified tender. Not as a diver, but as a tender. Then you, you, you get a job. You go offshore. Uh, wait, wait a minute. It, all the saturation diving I know of, for the most part, has always been done offshore, except when they did something like the gold recovery, because it, it costs a ton of money to run the saturation diving complex. I mean, uh, a, million to million, a million dollars a day is not uncommon. At any rate, because then you've got a huge barge with a huge crane on it because you're doing construction or salvage work of some kind. Anyway, so you go to school, let's say you go to school for six months, you get out of school, you become a tender, you work at minimum wage, and again, you get, you work 12 hours on, 12 hours off when you're offshore, and, and you, you learn about all of the systems, because uh, all the systems are, are a little bit different. Then, then you get a chance, they need a diver, they don't have a regular diver available, they, they they'll pick this, this tender and say, okay, are you ready to make a dive like this? Yes, I, sir, I am. I'm eager to do so. Then they'll put you in the water. Then depending on how you perform in the water, then they'll decide to make you into a diver or keep you as a tender. 
so then you graduate from, if you will, you graduate from being a, you graduate from dive school to become a tender. You graduate from being a tender to become a diver. Then when you become a diver, then you have all these different skill sets that you get into. Once you become a diver that's successful at that, then when they need a new saturation diver, they'll come to you and say, are you ready to go into sat? All the divers will say, yeah. And uh, when you go into sat, you're gonna be put in a chamber with at least seven guys. And the chamber is going to be seven feet in diameter, maybe 30 feet long. And uh, it's really close quarters. You, you can speak to the, your fellow diver, but he can't understand what you're saying because you sound like Donald Duck. They have helium on scramblers, so you can each put on a headset. You can talk to one another that way, but you can't talk in person, from to person to person. You are confined in there. Uh, food doesn't taste like it does here. You, when you're in saturation, you can order anything you want to eat, and they will try to give you anything and everything you want except alcohol. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's extremely confining. It's extremely confining, and uh, uh, not everybody can do it because you can't be confined in that small space with other people for that period of time. You have to have a lot of self-control uh, to do that. So going back to um, DUI's involvement with this, because um, I've always seen you know, the pictures of these divers with the big helmets and the heavy lead boots and walking around on the bottom, you know, just like you see on TV. Um, and I know that uh, DUI's hot water suits were used for this. So I do have a picture of, of you in a hot water suit. Um, if, so is this the version that was used for that during the frame? No, no, this was the very first version of hot water suit. Uh, and that's me when I was young and skinny. And um, essentially in my right hand there, uh, where I'm holding the hose is where the control valve was. It, it that valve would bypass the water away from the diver or have the water come to the diver and had a quick disconnect in it. From there, the water flowed. Again, you can't see it because it's underneath my hand. The water would then go into the suit where you see two little knobs there. Those two, one of those knobs controlled the water flow to the front of the suit. The other valve controlled the water to the, to the back of the suit. Since then, we have discontinued having water flow to the front and back but the latest hot water design by, uh, by uh, Doug West uh, has the ability that, that the first click only turns water onto your legs. And that's because when the diver is getting ready to go out, he sits down and puts his legs in the water. Well, that water is ice cold. And, and if he turns the water on in a regular suit, the water squirts out everywhere, including in your helmet. So it's really a pain in the butt. But or or the divers will take and disconnect the hose and stick the hose down your neck, and then then the water flows in, into your suit and down down your legs and helps keep the cold water off your legs. So in the new one, it just turns on your legs first, then you put on a helmet. Now, there was a time when we used masks. We don't use masks anymore. We all we we all wear helmets now, um, uh, and and the reason for that is they had some cases where an bilco got caught and it pulls and it pulls the mask off because the mask is held on with what we call the spider and the spider has is made of elastic material and if it gets pulled the wrong way it can pull the mask off, and uh, so now everybody wears a helmet, and uh, the the helmet protects your head. Uh, I was diving one time and I was out of the water and next to a ship and a guy cut a piece of metal on their ship and threw it overboard without realizing we were on a barge down below and that piece of metal hit my helmet and cut a big chunk out of it. <coughs> that hit my head, it could have killed me. So, I had a sore neck for a while. So I did, um, through uh, <laughs> some help, uh, while you were talking, um, I received this photo. Um, so is this the dry or the dry suit? The that's a hot water suit that was used in this time frame. If you look over on the right hand side, you can see the valve uh, and the quick disconnect. And the guy's inside a chamber. Uh, that's his bunk there. It's a, a table that he can eat or ride on, but then he lets the bunk down and 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 uh, whatnot. That's an older suit. Uh, I would say that suit is probably out of the seventies. 
Uh, it also at one time had a harness on it. That's when you see the black around the middle. Okay. Um, so another question or, or just something that's uh, explain why the hot water suit was advantageous over a dry suit. Um, Cause I know that I dive a dry suit and you go down 20 feet and you start feeling the squeeze. Um, so I assume the hot water suit has something that alleviates that process. Well, um, okay, look, in a wetsuit or a dry suit, or even the clothes you're wearing right now, that is all passive insulation, like, like putting a blanket on your bed, okay? In, in, in the case of a, of a wetsuit, the wetsuit rubber has air bubbles in it, that's your insulation. In the dry suit, you have the dry suit keeps you dry, the underwear keeps you, uh, keeps you warm, or it, it supplies the insulation. And in, in the dry suit, you've got a minimum of four times the insulation you're ever going to have in a wetsuit. That's just because the material you're wearing underneath the dry suit is trapping a lot more air than does your wetsuit. Uh, uh, but the, but it, it does not, the, the air you have trapped inside the dry suit does not have rubber next to it because rubber is actually a pretty good conductor of heat. Actually, if you could make a wetsuit out of, out of wood, it would be a lot better, but you couldn't move very well in it. So uh, that's why we do it that way. Okay, so that's passive insulation. If you go to Antarctica and 100 below zero, you can't put enough clothes on the outside of you to keep you warm. Not only that, but the more clothes you put on means the bigger your diameter gets, the bigger your diameter gets, the bigger surface area you have, and ultimately you'll get colder. For instance, in wetsuit gloves, if you start putting heavy rubber, thick rubber around your, your finger, you actually get to the point where the surface area of that gets so great that your finger will get colder, not warmer, let alone the fact you can't bend them. Now, okay, so then we get to a point where, where our body will lose more heat than our body manufactures. When, what we're trying to do is stay in thermal equilibrium so that we generate as much heat as we lose generate as much heat as we lose. But once we get to the point where we're losing more heat, and all your wetsuit divers are doing that, they're losing more heat to the ocean than they're manufacturing. But by the time they get done breathing a tank of air, they could get out and they can get warm again. Actually, they never, tr they never truly get warm again. I can tell you about that another day. So what we then need to do is have active insulation. All of you are familiar with active insulation by by going to uh, a, an electric blanket. You've all used an electric blanket before. So therefore, rather than you're losing your heat to the room you're sleeping in, the electric blanket is losing its heat to the room that you're sleeping in, preserving your heat. That is active insulation. In the case of a hot water suit, rather than having an electric circuit inside, what we do is we pump warm water. We bring the water in at about 105 degrees at a rate of about five gallons of water a minute. The water stays inside the suit for about one minute and then goes out. So during the one minute, it goes from being 105 degrees down to being about 93 degrees. What we try to do is keep the, the diver's skin temperature in saturation at about 93 degrees. And, and there's two reasons for that. One of them is, at depth, at about 450 feet, your body can actually lose more heat through your lungs than your body can manufacture. The surface area in your lungs is about equal to a football field. So when you've got that much surface area out there, it doesn't take much of a, pressure, a temperature differential to lose a lot of heat when you've got a football field worth of, of surface area. That's one of the, the human body is a magnificent mechanism. Mankind can never build anything near as good as it. At any rate, let's come back. So that's why when we get down 450 feet, we have to start heating the breathing gas. And we, we run through a counter flow heat exchanger. I can explain that someday if you want. Um, but but the, the water comes in at 105, mixes with the water inside your suit. Again, it's only in there for a minute. Uh, okay. And it, it dilutes to about 93 degrees and then goes out because it goes out around the hands, it goes out around the neck, and it goes out around the feet. We do make a suit that has a valve in the chest, and this was done for a special project in which if, if the water flow ever stops, uh, if the water flow stops and you're an open circuit hot water suit, 
you've got about three and a half minutes to get back to your diving bell before your skin temperature is going to be equal to water temperature and you're going to be freezing your butt off. So in this special suit we made, we put, we sealed the suit up, put a valve in the chest so that if the water su supply fails, you simply close that valve. Now you're containing and holding that 93 degree water inside your suit. Now you've got about 21 minutes to get back to the diving bell. That's a hell of a cushion. And you can almost always get back to your diving bell in that period of time, almost no matter how long your umbilical is, because you're going to be motivated to get the hell out of there. So I, another question is, do you use the salt water or fresh water? I, I assume you're using the water that's of the environment that you're in and it's being heated. Uh, that's right. But all of you have taken a bath in a bathtub. And you know, when you get out of the bathtub, when you look at your hands, your hands have, are, are dimpled on the end. On, on, the, on the end of your fingers and you'll find little wrinkles in your skin if you look for them and that's because the salt has been taken out of your skin so therefore when we're diving in the ocean we use salt water because the salt water in the salt in the ocean is about equal to the amount of salt in your body and therefore we would prefer to use salt water the times when they don't and we did that in the Gulf of Mexico because they had problems with jellyfish. Jellyfish would get sucked into the suction to the hot water heater and the jellyfish would, would get disassembled in the pumps and everything. But nonetheless, their, their stinging cells, are no, they're called nematocysts, uh, uh, are pumped through the water and gets in where the diver is. And all of a sudden he is, he is in purgatory. He is being stung by a million bees all at one time. And some people are allergic to it because that is a protein toxin. So uh, the last question that I have is, what was the total value of the gold recovered? Uh, it was $100 million. Today it would be worth about, about three times that. So, so this is what it looks like, I guess, when you find that much gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, except that you had tons of it. I mean, tons of it. Those gold bars, like I said, they weighed 26 pounds apiece. And, uh, uh, and these guys are happy. I mean, they are happy beyond belief. And you look at their faces, their faces tells the story. And, and, and that was a very dangerous job. They didn't know that they wouldn't, that some of them wouldn't get killed on that job. And, and if they didn't recover the gold, they'd get nothing for, for it. So that was a no cure, no pay. No cure, no pay. So just to go back, this is the, uh, it's on YouTube, the, the quality of the videos, not, the best, um, so take it for what it is. It's a it's an old documentary on on this on this whole episode um, on YouTube, and I will also post this uh, in the comments. Uh, oh, Dave, Dave Phillips just just said gold's over three thousand dollars an ounce now. I remember when it was twenty seven dollars an ounce when we were gold diving in the rivers. And I'm posting this on the Facebook post also, so it's in time. Um, so that's what we have for, for this week. Um, uh, in, in two weeks, uh, which is on June 18th, uh, is our next episode. Uh, and we're, hopefully it's all gonna be on commercial diving um, and the history of commercial diving and what's going on today um, with commercial diving. And so come back in two weeks. And we'll see you then. So thanks, Dick, for, for presenting. And, and, and thank everybody for listening in. It's, uh, it's given me a chance to relive a very exciting time in my life. I, I, uh, uh, I've been very lucky to be involved in like the first thousand foot dives and things like that. It, it, I'm 83 now and it's, it's uh, it's very exciting to relive this stuff. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.